This one, section A, force and motion, is the second uh, lesson on this, uh, forces and shape. This is a very simple lesson. We build on this later when we look at Newton's laws, F is MA and so forth, and we look at the acceleration of an object. But um, so this is just a very brief introduction. Um, so we're just going to look at what the Newton is, looking at forces on diagrams, balance and unbalanced forces, friction and Hooke's law. But they're very, very straightforward. So I'll just start by saying the definition of the Newton, okay? Force is measured in Newtons, and one Newton is defined as the force required in order to accelerate a one kilogram mass through a rate of acceleration of one meter per second squared, okay? So that's what the Newton is, the force required to accelerate a mass of one kilogram by one meter per second squared. Now, when we look at any diagram, we need to be able to add forces, force arrows, if you like, to the diagram. So, for example, if we took um, something standard or a car, if we have a car, my incredibly well drawn car, if we have a car on a road, now we can see then there are forces on the car. Now those forces should be represented by arrows. Now the car's weight always acts downwards, okay? So the car has a weight, which is a force. Now the car should then go through the floor, but it doesn't. And it doesn't because the floor pushes upwards on the car. And that force, in order for the car to not go up or to go down, those forces must be balanced. So the force up, now it's actually called a reaction force, okay? Now, although you don't need to concern yourselves too much with this, but there's a force acting up from the ground up on the car and there's a force acting downwards. Now, if the engine provided a force, we would then have another force. So this might be the force caused by the engine. So we might have a force provided by the engine. And if this was the case, these two forces are acting in opposite directions. So these two forces would cancel each other out. So there'd be no net force up or down. However, to the left and to the right, we've got a force due to the engine. So here we've got an unbalanced force in this direction. That will mean that the car would move in this direction, all right? But normally you would have another force acting backwards, okay? And in this case, you think about a car, you've got air resistance or drag acting in the opposite direction if you've got motion in this plane, okay? You also have things like friction, okay? So you've got friction air resistance acting in the opposite direction. So if the, if the air resistance and the friction is acting in the opposite direction, if those forces are the same, then it's balanced, okay? If they are not balanced, then we get what's called a resultant force. So for example, if we have our car, and if we've got a force of say a thousand newtons in this direction, that's provided by say the engine, and if we have a force of say 600 newtons caused by friction, air resistance, then we've got an unbalanced force, and therefore we have a resultant force it's called, so we have a resultant force. And the resultant force is equal to this one, take away this one, okay? So it would be simply 1000, take away 600, which equals 400 newtons. And the resultant force is obviously 400 newtons in that direction, okay? So that's how you'd label a diagram with forces and calculate the resultant force acting on something, all right? So if we just look back, Friction always acts in the opposite direction of the motion. So whatever you've got, in any situation, if you've got um, a box, if the box has a force acting on it, and the box begins to move in this direction, so the box is moving in this direction, 
As soon as it does so, there must be a force acting in the opposite direction, and that would be friction. So friction always acts in the opposite direction of the motion, to oppose the motion. Okay, so friction is always in the opposite direction. Now we'll look at these in a much more quantitative way um, in the next session, all right? But before I do that, I just need to look at something else. We just need to look at Hooke's Law. Now, Hooke's Law, when we had a spring and you put a mass on a spring, you noticed, hopefully you noticed, that the amount that the spring stretched by was equal every time you put a new weight on. So when you draw this, we did a graph. In your lessons, you would have done a graph and you will have had two axes. Now you may have put these on the opposite way around. So you may have had load on this axis. And load is measured in newtons. And you would have had extension on this axis measured in meters. So in the experiment, you have a spring on a clamp and you add one newton, two newtons, three newtons and every time you add another newton the extension of the spring goes up by the same amount every time. So what you notice is the graph will do this. So the force or the load is proportional to the extension and that's Hooke's law. But the force or the load is proportional to the extension and that means if you put one newton on it, you'll get a certain extension. If you double it, the extension will double. If you put three newtons on, the extension will be three times. However, the graph does not continue in a straight line indefinitely because you reach something called the elastic limit. When you go past the elastic limit, the graph will curve, okay? So once you've gone past the elastic limit, This means that now the spring is permanently deformed and it will not return to its original length. All right, once you've gone past the elastic limit. But Hooke's law says force is proportional to extension, nice straight line, until you reach the elastic limit. If you go past the elastic limit, it's no longer proportional and it will no longer return to its original length. All right, 